Planetary Interior is what we know and how we know it. In 1864, Jules Verne published Journey to the Center of the Earth, in which the heroes not only travel towards the center of the Earth, but encounter all kinds of things along the way, including vast subsurface oceans that are hundreds or even a thousand miles long, all kinds of weather, and even dinosaurs. Jules Verne actually based his story on some ideas that were kicked around fairly seriously by geologists of the day. In the last 150 years, we've learned a lot about planetary interiors, both here on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. So let's go ahead and we're going to take a look. Now, you may ask, why is this important? We've never even set foot on these other planets, so why does it matter what's happening below the surface there? Well, the interior of a planet is going to determine a lot of things that are possible or not possible on other planets. For example, tectonics will dictate what surface features are present and may even have an impact on the planet's climate. Magnetic fields are also important. They're generated by a planet's interior, and they will determine whether or not terrestrial worlds are able to hold on to their atmosphere over long courses of time. Now, there are a couple basic things we're going to consider as we move through here. First, we're going to look at the mass of the planet. If a planet is not massive enough, it won't have enough gravitational pull to hold on to gases and maintain an atmosphere. We're going to consider the planet's composition, what elements it is made up of. We're also going to look at differentiation and whether or not that has resulted in various layers producing structure inside of a planet. Now, before we get too deep into all of these things, how do we know these things? Again, we've never set foot there, even though we've recently sent probes. How do we know these things? It largely comes down to mathematical modeling. Scientists can use our understanding of nature from things that we are able to do here on Earth, and using those same equations, we can make pretty good predictions for what should be happening inside of other planets. Now, a lot of people get freaked out by these because they say, oh, those are just theories. Scientists don't actually know that. Well, we've got a pretty good idea, actually. Remember that in science, any hypothesis needs to be backed up by observation. Specifically, the hypothesis needs to make a prediction that a future observation will be able to either verify or not. So what are some of the different things that we look at since we can't visit these planetary interiors? What do we observe? We look at any moons around the planet, and specifically we're looking at the orbit of the moon around its planet. Depending on how that planet's gravity tugs on the moon, that'll tell us something about what's happening in the planet's interior. We can do the same thing with artificial satellites, meaning missions and probes and things that we have orbiting there. A technique that was developed in the 1960s was very helpful. It was radar studies. Basically, you send a radio signal and you bounce it off of the planet, and depending on the characteristics of the light that bounce back to us, we can get a very precise idea of how the planet is moving, and again, that'll allow us to test the mathematical model predictions. And of course, now that we have missions orbiting the terrestrial worlds, we've got good measurements of their magnetic fields, and those can be used to verify or nullify mathematical models as well. Let's take a look at mass first. So the mass of a planet is actually extremely easy to figure out. We can do it just by looking at the planet's orbit. Now, it goes back to Kepler's third law, which you'll see right here is p squared equals a cubed, where p is the orbital period, how long it takes the planet to go around the sun, or how long it takes a moon to go around the planet. And a is the semi-major axis, the distance between the orbiting object and the central object. So that's Kepler's third law. Or is it? There is a flaw or a limitation to Kepler's third law, and that's that it does not take into account the mass of any objects. Sir Isaac Newton recognized this, and so he did some mathematical heavy lifting and came up with what we now call Newton's version, or Newton's form of Kepler's third law. And as you see here, this does take into account both the mass of the planet and the mass of the star that it's orbiting, 
or again the mass of a planet and the moon that is orbiting it. Now before we get too deep into planetary interiors I want to show you a simple mathematical model and how it works. In this specific example we're going to use a NASA spreadsheet to determine the mass of the whole planet of Mars. So let's go ahead and we're going to take a look. Here you see in this spreadsheet, which is based on Newton's version of Kepler's third law, we're going to be finding the mass of Mars using orbital data of Phobos. Phobos is one of Mars's small moons. The specific observations is that over the course of time, the distance of Phobos from the surface of Mars was measured. You see those here. And it is plotted on the graph here. Each of these red dots is a different observation. The mass of Mars is down here, and it is based on the values plugged into the equation using these slider bars up here. So these are the different aspects of Phobos's orbit. And as we change these values, the goal is going to be to get the black line to fit, to match the shape of, the red dotted observations. The more we play with these values, the better the fit gets. It will never be perfect, but again, it demonstrates that using some basic measurements and mathematical heavy lifting, we can determine the mass of a planet. Moving on from mass, let's look at a planet's composition. Again, this is done using mathematical modeling. We can get pretty good estimates of what is happening in each of the layers below a planet's surface. Remember that these models are always cross-checked with multiple observations. Now, what we've discovered about composition is that it's fairly similar across all the planets. Each of the various layers is going to have roughly the same composition. And we're going to look at that as we go through the different layers. Of course, this brings up the question of where do layers come from? Which means what exactly is differentiation? Now, differentiation is the process of making layers and it is based on the density of the various materials in the planet. Remember that higher density materials will sink towards the bottom or interior of a planet and low density materials will float up towards the top. Best example of this is oil and water. If you mix these two and you shake them up really well they will not remain together for very long. Because they have very different densities among other properties they will eventually separate into two distinct layers. The same exact thing happens in planetary interiors. Now, the result is different layers inside of a planet. Here we see the Earth as our basic guide. At the very center of Earth, you have a solid inner core surrounded by an outer core, which is still molten. Outside of the outer core is the mantle, which is also molten. The reason these two layers are distinct goes back to their composition. The inner core and the outer core have roughly the same composition, but one is solid and one is fluid. The mantle has a different chemical composition than either parts of the core. Now, on the very outside, the Earth's crust has a very diverse composition, literally thousands of different kinds of minerals. To give you an idea for a sense of scale, the crust or lithosphere on the Earth is very thin. How thin? Well, picture an apple. The thickness of the Earth's crust is less than the thickness of the skin on the apple in comparison. Now, these are the layers that are going to be present on any of the terrestrial worlds. And here, this graphic does show the four planets to scale. You see that all of them have a core, all of them have a mantle, and all of them have a crust. But the core and the mantles are very different thicknesses from each other. And these layers and their thicknesses are very important when it comes to magnetic fields. First, let's talk about what a magnetic field is, and then we'll step back and look at what causes it. Think of a bar magnet. You know, you have a north pole and a south pole, and lines of magnetic force will arc outward from one to the other. Let's watch this brief video for a good demonstration of magnetic fields. Okay, here it is. We've got a stack of magnets underneath, a stack of the rock magnets, and we're going to put iron filings over the top here. And we finally got a piece of paper that's not glossy, so this ought to be easier to see. Alright, there's our magnetic field line. 
lines. As I tap it, they kind of align even better, especially on the outside. Things to notice. Which side is north and south? We figure out what a compass. That, that south is attracted to a north. And north attracted to the south. Now, which one is which is really rather irrelevant. You'll notice in the center that they go straight across from north to south. Then, they also go on the outside from north to south in these big arcs. Now, what, what about here? It's doing the same thing three-dimensionally right alongside the magnet. We can actually show this three-dimensionality of it just like that. Just like you saw magnetic fields taking shape on the paper there, stars and planets also have magnetic fields. Here you see an example of one with a bar magnet placed at the center of the Earth. You have magnetic field lines traveling out from one pole to the other. Notice that the geographic North Pole and the magnetic North Pole do not line up. The magnetic pole does actually wander from year to year, which is a fascinating study in and of itself, but we'll have to save that for another time. Most planets will have a magnetic field, but not all of them. And this is important for atmospheres, because remember, if a planet does not have a magnetic field protecting it from the solar wind coming from the sun, that solar wind will eventually strip away the atmosphere from that terrestrial planet. Now, what exactly do magnetic fields tell us? They do tell us something very important about what's happening inside of a planet, specifically that there is a dynamo effect occurring. Let's go back to those layers. So there are multiple layers within a planet, and specifically we're looking at the core, the molten outer core. If a planet has a molten outer core, it should have a magnetic field. What that molten material is doing is it's allowing a lot of electric charges, a lot of ions to move around, and as the planet spins, this generates a magnetic field due to the moving electric current. This circulation inside of the planet is what generates the magnetic field. Now, what we're going to see as we look at the magnetic fields of the terrestrial planets one by one is that Earth has a very different and very unique magnetic field in the inner solar system. Mercury, for example, barely has a magnetic field at all. It does have one, but it's wimpy. It's like 1% the strength of Earth's. Venus essentially has no magnetic field. It's got one sort of but not really. Earth we have a very happy magnetic field and Mars is going to be very similar to Venus. It does have some remnants of a magnetic field but there's really not too much there. Let's look at some graphics and kind of see each of these magnetic fields one by one. Here we see the magnetic field of Mercury. The Sun is on the left and the solar wind is magnetic in nature and so it's compressing the magnetic field lines on the side towards the Sun and stretching them out over here going away from the Sun. What this graphic does not show is how weak Mercury's magnetic field is. Skipping outward, I want to look at Earth again because notice that the structure of the magnetic field is very similar to what we just saw in Mercury a moment ago. The magnetic field is compressed on the Sunward side and stretched on the side that's going away from the Sun. We're going to look at the magnetic fields of Venus and Mars together because they are very similar. Venus does not have a true magnetic field. It does have something, but it's not generated by the interior of the planet. Venus has a very thick atmosphere. In that very outermost layer of the atmosphere, known as the ionosphere, there are ions hanging out, and the solar wind interacts with these and generates some very wimpy form of a magnetic field. You can see it's very convoluted and there's not nearly the structure that we saw in the magnetic fields of either Mercury or Earth. Mars, again, is very, very similar to Venus. It does not have a true magnetic field. It does have something interesting down here in the South Pole region is it does appear that there used to be a magnetic field and that there's a little bit of a remnant of it here in this one place, but it's only hanging out in small sections of the crust. All of our observations indicate that this is not generated from deep in the planet's interior as the magnetic field is for Mercury and for Earth. The magnetic fields, again, are related to the internal structure of the planet. Notice that Mercury and Mars have very small cores and there's not a lot to them whereas Earth has a very active core. 
Okay, enough magnetic field stuff for right now. Let's begin moving back inside the interior of a planet. We're going to take a look at tectonics. What are those? Basically, tectonics are the interaction of a planet's interior with its crust. Now, what's happening is you have all kinds of circulation patterns inside of a planet, molten material moving around, and this is going to not only generate a magnetic field, it's going to have an effect on the surface of a planet as well. This is a basic schematic of what a convection cell looks like. Here, deep inside of the Earth, material is going to be very hot. Because it's hot, it's going to have a low density and therefore have a tendency to rise. As it rises, it's going to push other material to the side, and eventually this molten material will punch through to the surface. It'll continue pushing other material to the side, which is why you see this cold, now solid crust moving off this way. The push from the mantle will continue to push the plate to the side. Where different pieces of crust interact, sometimes you'll have a piece of crust slip down underneath another piece and it'll begin, because it's cold, sinking back down into the mantle due to that higher density. As the material sinks, it will eventually be melted and simply rejoin the circulation pattern once more. These convection cells are what make tectonics work. What are some of the things that can stop this circulation pattern? Well, there are really only two things. One is that the planet can continue to cool down until its crust gets too thick. As that crust thickens on the outside, it is more and more difficult for material to rise up from deep in the planet's interior. If the crust is too thick and that material can no longer reach the surface, it basically cuts off or halts that circulation pattern. This can have an effect on what's happening at the surface and can even result in the magnetic field of the planet shutting down due to a lack of circulation. The other thing that can stop circulation in a planet is Hollywood. Good job, Hollywood. Let's take a look at terrestrial tectonics. Mercury does not have any tectonics. The planet has such a small mass and small physical size that it cooled very, very quickly. As a result of this cooling, the circulation pattern is simply shut off. The closest thing that Mercury has to tectonic activity is contraction. As material cools, remember that it will shrink. And as the interior cooled and shrank, the outer crust was rigid and it kind of had to buckle and break and fold a bit in order to keep there from being any gaps. So that process of some earthquakes as the crust cracks and continues to shrink down is really the only type of tectonics that Mercury has. And it's not true tectonics, but it's the closest thing to it. Venus is a real mystery. We really don't know what Venus has. The closest thing we've been able to figure out is Venus appears to have a thick enough crust that it's a shell. That circulation pattern can't get material all the way up to the surface anymore, at least not regularly. The surface of Venus appears to be very, very young, and that indicates that every so often the entire surface, the entire crust, is resurfaced and there must be some type of cataclysmic event or eruption where all of a sudden this pressure that's built up inside releases and recoats the planet with magma. Earth has plate tectonics. It's not a solid shell. There are different pieces floating along the top of the mantle. Mars is an interesting character as well. It appears that it had plate tectonics in the past, but like Mercury, it has now cooled so much but there is no longer a circulation pattern and things don't move around on the crust anymore. It appears to be in the process of contracting and so occasionally we'll get earthquakes as the crust cracks and buckles due to internal contraction. Thank you for joining me on this brief tour of planetary interiors. As we've considered all of these different characteristics of a planet's interior, we've seen that each terrestrial world puts its own spin on things making each part of our inner solar system in some way unique.